Wireless Land Weekly, episode 54. Welcome to the Wireless Land Weekly podcast. Bringing together the valuable knowledge of WLAN industry experts, news, and the latest technology developments, tools, and best practices. A place to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. Here is your host, WLAN veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. Welcome back to Wireless Land Weekly. In this week's episode, we're going to pay special attention to the Wireless Tech Field Day coming up next week. So in our main topic, it's just going to be a bunch of uh, delegates from Wireless Field Day who will share a little bit about their feedback and information and what they like about it. We also have a tutorial topic on the four different MAC addresses used in the 802.11 header. And we'll also have a who is Andrew Von Nagy. So welcome to the show and enjoy. A word for the WLAN Geek Dictionary. A basic service set. A basic service set is the term that describes the footprint of a single access point and all associations, all stations associated with it. The BSS is defined by all stations who associate to a single access point, and in every frame they send, they will acknowledge this fact by sending the BSSID or the MAC address of the AP in the MAC layer header. Wireless LAN Weekly Podcast, your source of education, information, entertainment, and inspiration. Well, welcome to the main topic on this episode of Wireless LAN Weekly. We'll be talking about a wireless tech field day. Uh, Stephen Foskett uh, kind of invented this whole uh, genre of conference. Uh, a couple years ago with some, uh, you know, normal tech field days and networking tech field day and finally pulled out the wireless tech field day. I've been involved uh, personally for, for quite some time with these and uh, both as a, as someone just listened and as well as a, a on-site delegate. And uh, along with me and uh, a couple other users, Blake Crone, Chris Little, Devin and Ryan, we'll, we'll share a little bit about how we feel uh, tech field day has helped us and what it's good for us. So go ahead and just listen in on the next series of interviews, little baby interviews about the value of Wireless Tech Field Day. Hope you join us next week with Wireless Tech Field Day. We won't be having a podcast on that day since it's the start of, I mean, our normally regularly scheduled podcast release is right on top of Tech Field Day. And I'd much rather have you be listening in and, and participating in Wireless Tech Field Day. So thanks. Wireless Tech Field Day question for Blake Crony. Question is, what's Wireless Tech Field Day done for your career? Second half, what should someone do if they want to get involved? So what has Wireless Tech Field Day done for my career? You know, I think the biggest the biggest advantage that I've gotten from coming to these events, besides the networking with great peers like yourself and, and the other crew here of delegates, is really being able to sit down and talk with a different level of vendors and when I say levels, I mean the employees at the vendors than what I would normally get on a day-to-day basis. A lot of the times when you go to talk to a vendor, you know, let's say you go to their website and you fill out the contact form, you're going to get somebody from sales or an account executive or somebody from marketing that's going to start doing the market texture to you that none of us really want to hear. Maybe if we're another account manager, we want to hear that. But if you're a techie, you don't want to hear that. I want to hear from the actual people like Victor Strom from Ruckus that just melt your brain with RF physics when you sit there and you try to listen to him. And I, when I have to just try to listen to him because he's a very smart guy and you're just kind of like, okay, I'm starting to get glossed over, but this is really good stuff because this is what RF is. Talking about single signal propagation and the bending and different objects, how they affect it. You know, that being able to hear those different people, it just gives you a whole different insight into wireless technologies and RF especially. And you get to learn about a product that, you know, you normally wouldn't maybe mess with. And then you start to actually have more firsthand personal knowledge that you can use if you need to in in a competitive uh, scenario where a customer is looking at vendor A versus vendor B. If you want to get involved and, and join this uh, crazy bunch of delegates, because we are quite an interesting group of delegates, I, you know, the thing is, is you got to get involved on the social media. We want to start to learn about who you are, what you have to say, what your viewpoint is, because that's really important. You know, and you, you want to head over to techfieldday.com and fill out a link. You know, anybody can apply to be a delegate. 
and we all voted on. Even the returning delegates are voted on by other delegates to see who keeps coming back and who the new faces are. And you just you know you gotta you gotta go out there, fill out the survey, start blogging, start tweeting, start getting yourself out there, get involved with the rest of us, and you know once we start to see where you positioned at, you know, we look at who can bring what to the table for um, what the sponsors are that are going to be at the event and geographical locations work out well too. I can't, you know, we like to have different areas, European nations. Um, it's just, it's important to have a variety. So speak a little bit about if you're not a delegate, how can tech field day still be good for you? Yeah. So if you're not a delegate, you know, you definitely want to try to follow the the Twitter streams as much as you can. The hashtag is always just going to be, you know, hashtag and then, you know, WFD and then the number or TFD if it's a tech field day. Um, so you, you get that information at the techfieldday.com, but you can also be involved in the, the live streaming. You know, we've got a great production crew that comes on site that does the video streaming of the event. And the thing that I think is great is we get all these viewers that can't be here but then if you start tweeting questions, you know, let's say something you don't understand what the presenter is talking about. If you tweet it and you've got the hashtag on there, us delegates, we're looking at those and we're trying to feed those questions into the presenter. So we're going to try to help you out to get your answer by being your voice in the room. And even a lot of the vendors have started to have their crews watching the Twitter streams as well so that they don't miss the questions as well. So they can, even if we don't get it answered for you on the camera or on the stream, Hopefully, maybe somebody will answer it in the Twitter feed for you. So I think even if you're not here, it's great to be watching the streams you know, on Twitter, watching it on techfieldday.com so you can see the live video, and, and just see what's going on and, and get the information that way. Tech Field Day has, uh, has really boosted my career significantly. The number of uh, the relationships with the vendors that we worked with and the business that uh, the, my work business that, that I've been involved in Tech Field Day has really helped boost both my profile within my workplace and, and also the relationships with the vendors that we worked in. I mean it's it's been outstanding in, in what it's actually helped my career with. How would you recommend others uh, to get involved in Tech Field Day? Write a blog. Yeah so uh, I, would, I would recommend uh, the way that others would get involved in Tech Day, Field Day is, is first of all start writing a blog then uh, get involved in Twitter and, and start tweeting about the blog posts that you write on Twitter. Great okay what do you think about the value of Wireless Tech Field Day? So I think uh, Wireless Tech Field Day is a, uh, a very unique um, marketing focused event that the real value um, is is that of a, a general awareness um, there's some you know certainly some uh, uh, tried and true approaches uh, there's some boring approaches that maybe it gets the point across and the delegates uh, uh, react to negatively but I think in general um, it is a very loud uh, very amplified uh, way of marketing very quickly so you get the industry's finest in a room and they all have uh, a huge sometimes small, sometimes uh, big, but an effective audience of their own. And you can, you can talk to um, the ones, you know, that are, we'll say out there in the, in the ether or on the internet or that's, that don't have the ability or time to engage you through these delegates. And so you put your best foot forward for a very short period of time, let's call it two hours or what have you. And you're able to be heard globally and recorded. And it's not just the, the, in the moment, but also the afterwards effect of being able to watch these videos and understand value propositions and understand differentials between vendors. Uh, there's an after effect as well. And so I think it's, if you summed all that up, I would say it's a way to get awareness for the, for your vendor very quickly and in, in a very uh, geographically d uh, diverse way. My thoughts on wireless field day. Well, one, I've got to thank Stephen Foskett for putting the whole tech field day idea together it's a wonderful chance for, for everyone who's involved. Uh, it's obviously a business for Stephen, and it works well for him. It's good for the vendors. It gives them a chance to focus and bring their best game together with um, the delegates, and not only the delegates, but everyone who's watching either live or on the recordings later. Let them see the technical side. I think it's wonderful to sit in the room, hear the tech. I wish all the vendors could learn that 
it's not about the marketing. You don't need to bring your marketing person to the wireless tech field day or any tech field day. Bring the technologists, the engineers, the guys who designed it, who impress people with their knowledge that they know some amazing things out there. One of the, one of the best uh, events ever so far in, in my recollection was during Meraki's session. They didn't talk about their cloud. They didn't talk about their Wi-Fi, their APs, or their switches, or any of those things. They brought a guy that talked about how they build databases and make the databases work in that multi-tenancy environment. That guy's brilliant, fantastic, and I learned something that I didn't expect to learn at a tech field day. Those are the kind of ones where you go, you get impressed, and you realize you're just, you know, an ant when it comes to the intellectual levels with other people that are out there in our industry. So the Tech Field Day, I think, is a, a wonderful event where we go, learn, share, and walk away and then repeat it again six months later and learn again. So I just want to comment and say, I love Wireless Tech Field Day. It brings a lot of us together and, and builds a community of other wireless LAN professionals. Ryan, can you just tell us, uh, you've been to a couple tech field days. What's tech field day done to your career and, and would you recommend others to get involved? Tech field day has provided me with the uh, opportunity to meet some really fantastic people um, that have been able to uh, assist me in problems, um, guide me in decisions with products and um, reinforce ideas that I already had. Basically, taking any, you know, when I was uh, thinking of something and I thought I was on the right track, backing it up with other people's knowledge. Um, Tech Field Day has been able to give me that. They've also been able to give me a voice with the vendors of the products that I use every day, um, letting them know what I like and don't like. And I have seen changes in f future revisions of the products as they come out with little tweaks that I don't want to take credit for, but um, you know, I've actually recommended, uh, and I'm sure that others have also, but it's nice seeing a product evolve with something that you've, uh, suggested. So tech field day has really given me that as well as a chance to travel around a little bit. And what about recommending toward others, how that, how they should get involved? I'd highly recommend getting involved with tech field day. Um, definitely go sign up to be a delegate. You don't have to be the biggest, the best, the best writer, the, the best engineer out there. Just have a voice and be loud. All right. Thanks. Appreciate that. Back to basics with Keith. In a previous tutorial, we talked about the two bit and the from bit, the DS bits that are tell you which direction of travel things go on. In today's episode on this tutorial section, we're going to talk again about the four addresses in the 802.11 MAC header. But when do we use all four? It's only, it's a very unique situation when all four are fired up. To review what we talked about in the two bit and from bit, uh, the four addresses are source, destination, transmitter, receiver. Normally in the ethernet frame, we only have a source and destination, but because access points and clients use wireless, we had to have a transmitter and receiver address in there as well. Normally, when you have frames going to or from the wired to wireless network, it's either from wireless to wired or from wired to wireless. And the AP is sitting in the middle doing this bridging function. It also converts 802.11 on the wireless side to 802.3 on the wired side. On the wireless side, it uses source, destination, transmitter, receiver. On the wired side, it only uses source and destination. But there's one scenario when we'll use all four of those addresses uniquely. Again, normally, two of them are the same. If you're going from wired to wireless, the receiver address and the destination address are the same. If we're going from wireless to wired, the transmitter and the source are the same. So when do we use all four? All four happens when we have an AP in wireless bridge mode, or sometimes this is called wireless distribution service, where the DS side is another wireless link. This is when you would have a wireless bridge and the transmitter and receiver are on one side of the bridge. The next hop is to another AP. 
and then the final hop is to another client on the other side. And in this case, the source is on one BSS, the destination is on another BSS off of another AP. The transmit and receiver are specifically for that wireless bridge pair. So we have four addresses in our 807 MAC header. Normally we only use three. We figure out which three are being used based on the two DS and the from DS bits. But when all four are used, that means we're running a wireless distribution service or a wireless bridge. And that's how you can tell that something's in bridge mode is when all four of those are being used. This is the Power Minute with today's podcast special guest. Who is Andrew Von Nagy? So Andrew, so who you are, who are you, <laughs> what do you do, and where do you work? Hi, I'm Andrew Von Nagy. Uh, I work at Airtight Networks as a director of evangelism currently. What's, what's a director of evangelism do? What I do for a living essentially is I uh, go around evangelizing about Wi-Fi. I talk about uh, why the Wi-Fi industry, uh, use cases, uh, what people are trying to do with it, what they need to accomplish in their business, and uh, how different uh, solutions map into that. I, I essentially uh, map technology back into uh, business solutions and, and kind of bridge the gap between those two because that skill set is typically pretty rare uh, for a lot of organizations to find internally or for skill sets. So they're looking for that, uh, you know, expertise around how uh, technology maps back into their business and how it can solve some of their problems. Good. So how did you get into the IT industry? I, I was actually, uh, I got into the IT industry because I was in college and I took an internship at the local K-12 school district while I was there. I had uh, an uncle that was a director of IT at the school district. And I was actually at that time a math major in college. And I was just looking for a part-time summer job and in order to make some extra cash on the side, uh, you know, to have some spending money. I, I got into it because uh, I ended up paying pretty well, and I p was pulling cable for like the first summer that I was in IT. I was a freshman in college, um, crawling underneath dirty old school buildings that are 100 years old, uh, trying to fish some, uh, you know, Cat5 cable through there so that we could wire up some... PCs and uh, in the classrooms and things like that and kind of just evolved from there. I fell in love with uh, with technology, learning all about uh, you know routing and switching and and doing all the subnetting and just kind of got deep into it and had a great mentor early in my career, which I think is a big benefit for anybody in their career. Uh, he was an old radio guy that uh, also ran the local um, public radio network uh, um, tower. And he got into networking and built this, the school district's original IP network. And so he kind of bridged both of those sides of, the, uh, of, of technology, both the RF and the, the IP side and the wired side. So I uh, had a great mentor from early on. And, you know, he would take the time to actually help me learn whatever I wanted to know. We'd spend hours just whiteboarding and he would explain everything in, you know, intimate detail to me. And so that was a great help and got me really excited about technology. So what was your first computer? My first computer was a Packard Bell uh, that ran, I believe, Windows 3.1. Uh, I don't remember using much with it. I remember it had a very horrible GUI, if you will, with file manager and things like that. And uh, I really got into more of the DOS command line prompt. I really used it mainly to play games and then uh, to type up some, some very early documents on a word processor for school assignments. So uh, it must have been early 90s, I would say. So now, Mac or PC user? I am currently what I call a hybrid compute user. Um, I use Mac OS X in certain situations. That's my primary computing platform for web surfing, email, um, what have you, day-to-day -day activities. Uh, I use a, a Windows 7 uh, virtual image uh, running on Parallels on that Mac in order for a lot of my wireless tool sets, which Unfortunately, a lot of the software in the wireless industry only runs on Windows at this point. So I keep a Windows 7 image around. And then I am uh, also early in my career, I was also a big security uh, kind of techie. So I like a lot of security distros. So I, I'm a Debian user by uh, by trade at heart. Um, unfortunately, Debian doesn't lend itself too, too well to a lot of the security 
aspects. So I, you know, favor backtrack or Kali Linux now as, as they've ported it for a lot of the security um, type of pen testing or, or things like that. So I'll use whatever best fits my needs. Um, I'd say that, you know, I don't really have an affinity for one over the other. I kind of just switch between them all depending on what I need to do. Do you think someone who's a wireless engineer needs to have a college degree? That's an interesting question because I think I think it kind of is going to evolve over time. I think um, when I came through IT, I know a lot of professionals that don't have college degrees but are very, very bright individuals, and I think it has to do with the maturity of the industry. I think uh, historically IT is you know, fairly still immature compared to other professions like you know financial or lawyers or medical. So I don't think there's that stringent requirement to be certified and there's no you know, professional body that certifies things uh, from a governmental licensing perspective. So I think from that aspect today, you can definitely be an IT professional without having a college degree. I think over time, uh, moving forward in the future, at some point, um, IT as a profession is going to get more stringent, more mature, and I think we will start to see more of that structured requirement for uh, a college degree. But at this point, it's still not a requirement, and I don't think it has to be. I think uh, I judge people based on their skills and experience and their aptitude for, you know, actually deploying solutions and accurately designing solutions. So that's about talking about uh, education. What about certifications? I'm always on the fence about certifications, even though I, I, I kind of hold a, a few of my own. Um, I've always taken the path of certifications are really are about helping you learn the theory behind the content. And then the other half of that is going out and practicing it. So I think certifications do a great job of introducing you to the content, but it's on you to then go out. And even if you've gotten the paper certificate, go out and make sure you map that back into experience and and learn those things firsthand. So if you're reading about subnetting, don't just read about it in a book in like a CCNA, you need to actually go out there, buy a router, Throw, throw up a couple of subnets, learn how to do it, right? Same thing with wireless. If you're learning how to do a site survey, don't just read about it. Go out there and actually get your hands on some of the evaluation software and go out and practice it and, and live it for a period of time so that you know exactly what goes into it. What about a home lab? Is that you recommend that? I absolutely recommend people um, deploy a home lab because you learn best by doing. And that's the only real way that you're going to be able to develop that skill set as an IT professional, I think. So if you're in the IT profession, uh, it kind of is par for the course. Like I tell people, just like, you know, kind of on-call is par for the course for most IT professionals, having a home lab is, is almost a mandatory requirement in order to learn and stay up to speed. I mean, things change so rapidly. So absolutely a requirement. What do you think about uh, the value of social media for IT professionals? Social media is an interesting uh, concept to explore because it really um, has helped broaden um, the conversations and the sharing of knowledge within the industry. I can remember a time before I even joined Twitter where I thought that I was kind of like the only person that knew wireless out on this island on my own. I was out there studying it. No, Nobody else really um, that I interacted with from you know a professional or, or, or colleagues that I worked with at the job really cared about wireless cared about it enough to study it to the depth that I did. And I thought I was kind of just out there on my own. And it's one of those things where um, Twitter and, and some of these social media avenues can really bring together kind of a virtual community to really share that knowledge and to really get, you know, it can help in all sorts of in- instances like sharing information amongst one another, troubleshooting a problem and getting a quick answer, a quick response, uh, and leveraging the knowledge and experience that a lot of other people have. You really realize that you're not alone out there. There's a lot of people doing this, um, and you just are a distributed, you know, kind of community, and it brings everybody together. And then taking that a step further with some of the excellent programs out there like Tech Field Day, you actually get to meet these people in person, and that's when what brings home the social media aspect is meeting people in person and finding out who they are and developing interpersonal relationships with them. And I think some of the best friends that I have um, in this profession, I've, I've initially uh, got introduced to them through social media and then met them in person. And, and those are some of the bonds that you would just never have otherwise. Great. If you didn't have to have any money in your life, if money wasn't an object, what would you do? If money weren't an object, I would probably do one of two things. Uh, number one, I'm an outdoor um, kind of oriented person. I would have a goal in my life to travel the world. I love travel. I love experiencing different cultures, uh, different people. 
their different perspectives and worldviews and just understanding the world better. So I'd, I would travel a ton. Um, the second thing that I would do is um, I would spend a lot of time exploring hobbies of mine that I just love. Like I would go to every baseball stadium in the U.S. Uh, my wife and I love to camp and hike, so we would probably visit every national park uh, and state parks as well. So really, uh, most of it revolves around me for, for travel and lifestyle around um, exploring both the natural world as well as then the cultural human world outside of my um, experiences thus far. What inspires you to get up and go to work in the morning? I'm inspired to go to work every day to see other people succeed and to help other people succeed, I'd say. Uh, when I can talk to a customer, talk to a partner, um, go help with the deployment uh, of a network or, or help design the network, and I see that it actually meets real tangible goals that that uh, company or individual has in their life, that's just an incredible high, I would say, is being able to see uh, something that you've helped and had an influence on succeed. And so that's really the motivation for me to get up every day is to see success in the world. What advice would you give someone who is just starting out in the, in the industry? If somebody is just starting out in the industry, I would give them um, the advice to read. Read, 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 and don't stop reading. Um, I think the most successful people in the in the world in any profession are those that that take the time to um, to learn. And learning for me starts with reading. I know a lot of people um, learn in different ways. Uh, you could learn by doing. You could learn by visual representations. You can learn by reading. I guess for me, since I say reading because that's the way that I learn best, I'd say you know it could be any way that you learn best. Go out and do that. Um, and I, I would say just. The more you pursue learning, the more successful you'll be in whatever you try to do. Uh, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, so one of my I read a lot about Warren Buffett and his success, and and one of the things that he said is he's not doesn't have this innate ability that allows him to invest better than anyone else. He doesn't see the world any more intelligently than anyone else. He takes the time to read as much as he can, and he says he reads so many hundreds of pages a day of content, and he just soaks it all in. And this is what allows him to be informed to make better decisions, uh, to be successful. So I, that's what I say is never stop learning, never stop reading. And I think it's almost mandatory, you know. So if you're in IT and you feel like, you know, you're never going to be able to stay up to date, maybe you should get think about getting into a different profession that's a little bit more laid back, right? Because IT is always going to be changing, at least at this point. That's great. Thanks. Wireless LAN Weekly Podcast. Your source of education, information, entertainment, and inspiration. Well, thanks for listening to uh, this episode uh, number 54 of Wireless LAN Weekly. We're glad you're able to join us and hear us talk a little bit about uh, Wireless Tech Field Day. Tune in next week. We're not going to have a podcast on that day because the normal release date is when we have Tech Field Day, and I strongly recommend you go out to Tech Field Day, listen in on the presentations. There'll be some great presentations. You can watch them live or you can watch them recorded as well. So thanks for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed your little baby tutorial on the four Mac addresses and learned a little bit about Andrew Von Agee. So thanks for listening and we'll see you in two weeks with the next episode. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Wireless LAN Weekly Podcast. Head to WLANpros.com for this episode, show notes, and the latest industry news. Connect today, WLANpros.com. A place to educate, inform, entertain, and 